Maeva is the founder and CEO of Flying Cat Marketing, full service SEO and content agency for B2B SaaS companies. She's driven organic growth for companies that you've known and love, like Hotjar, Active Campaign, Livestorm, and Mace. With a psychology degree, she emphasizes a human approach to SEO, which is fantastic. Maeva is also an angel investor, fractional CMO, marketing advisor, agency coach, and much, much more. In her free time, she enjoys improv, practicing Italian, and traveling. Maeva, floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. So I really appreciate you inviting me, Bernard, uh, to ClearScope. Love your webinars, love all your content. So today I want to talk about optimizing your content reoptimization strategy. So I know everybody here hears it all the time. Lowest hanging SEO fruit is optimizing existing content before creating anything new. I think that's widely known. Um, yet there are so many strategies. When I see client strategies and a lot of people that I talk to, it's all new content, new content, new content, new content. Um, some people will optimize when the, when they inherit a new SEO responsibility. The first thing they're going to do is what content can I reoptimize? Do a content audit and see that it exists. Some of them have a kind of regular cadence, um, and I think that very few organizations bake it into their ongoing workflow. So that's kind of what I want to introduce to you guys today: the idea uh, and see how it can actually give you that exponential growth that we look for in SEO. Um, so I have this slide introducing myself, but Bernard already did an excellent job. My name is Maiva. I run Flying Cat. Uh, we do full service, so strategy on page, technical content off page, and focus mostly on B2B SaaS. Um, so what I'm going to go into today is first reasons you might want to optimize existing content. Um, the metrics that will help you make these decisions and how to bake it into your regular workflow. I see that there's some questions popping up. I think Amanda is managing those. I'm not going to be looking at them until later on, uh, just so I can stay focused. So why do we want to re-optimize content? I strongly believe that existing content optimization needs to be part of the regular SEO workflow. Um, so the point of SEO, right, is that the, it lowers the cost of acquiring a customer because your content stays online, it stays findable, you're not paying for the traffic. Um, and the more you build, the more of a compounding effect it provides. But it doesn't actually, it stays more linear if you're not, if you're ignoring existing content. Um, these are just some screenshots. This is like one page. Uh, here's a page. Here's a Sean Collins from uh, Squoro. Uh, he's really into it. And I was trying to find other LinkedIn um, screenshots of people talking about the amazing results they get from optimizing existing content. And it's kind of like if you were to be trying, if you were trying to grow a forest and you wanted to grow a really big forest and you just keep planting trees and planting trees and planting trees and you're not watering any of the trees that you've planted and you just keep planting them. So you'll get that kind of linear growth because they're all stacking on top of each other, but it's not compounding because the rest of the things that you worked on, you're letting them decay uh, or you're not giving them the biggest growth potential that they can have. So SEO only compounds if it's maintenance plus growth, not only growth alone. So there's a few reasons, a few reasons you might want to optimize content and I'll go into them in detail right now. One is content decay, uh, and then there's new keyword opportunities that appear or growing content that you've recently published, and then content is simply out of date. So content decay, so this study found that um, content lasts about 1.5 years before it starts to decay. And that's obviously the peaks and range are different, but uh, content will always start to decay if you ignore it. Uh, this is another example from um, Animals, where this was a piece that they published, and it was on this trajectory to go down 1.2 weekly. I think it ended up being a difference of uh, 40,000 or 50,000 visits monthly after a while after they started refreshing it. So you want to keep refreshing the content. And we have a poll here, which is very interesting. I'd be interested in hearing your responses to this. 
So content decay, so neglected content just loses value over time. About every year and a half, good, even if it was the best piece of content that you have, it starts to lose traffic, right? And lose rankings, and it just decays in its value. Um, and some common causes of this are going to be because the algorithm changes, because the search intent has changes, or competitors are updating content. So SERPs are known to be super volatile. What worked once uh, can suddenly stop working. So Google is obviously always trying to listen to the user and change the SERPs based on what users want. So this is an example that Lily Ray found um, in a study uh, that she performed um, where Google had completely shifted the SERP prioritization, prioritization for certain kinds of keywords and queries. So we had these best of, and this was back in January, Best of list uh, queries, they used to prioritize product review websites, magazines, bloggers, affiliate marketers. And so you can see here in red, um, the red ones are these kind of blogs and, and product reviews. And then so many websites were using affiliate marketing as a revenue stream, primarily fueled by SEO traffic. Users started complaining that the top ranking articles were too SEO-y. They were inauthentic. They didn't provide honest reviews, which is true. Now, actually, if I'm looking for the best night cream and I go onto a website, I'm going to see Vogue reviewing the best night creams. And I know that they probably haven't even tried them and they're all linking to whoever they have deals with. Right. So I'm looking for either the product directly or I'm looking for someone in a forum or a YouTube video or somebody who said they actually tried it and to tell me what was the before and after. So Google actually replaced the SERP with UGC. Uh, or forum content or direct e-commerce or product pages, which is great for e-commerce, less good for affiliate marketers. Um, and I'll provide the link to her post where she where she uh, walks through this study. Um, and this is why a lot of best of content has been decaying lately, and particularly in the B2C space. Um, so whether you can save that content or not, it really depends on your industry and your business model, and you may have to actually shift shift the content strategy depending on what you are actually trying to achieve. Um, search intent might have changed. So sometimes the intent itself changes. For example, before 2020, if you search for face mask, it would be people looking for supplies for their at-home day spa. Um, and in 2020, when you search for face masks, people were looking for personal protective equipment, right? So everyone who ranked highly for the skincare face masks were annihilated for the keyword face mask. And they probably had to shift their strategy to something like face mask skincare, skin face mask, I don't know, whatever it is that people then started to use because they shifted the language that they use with search engines uh, in order to be able to better specify what it is that they mean. And so this just happens sometimes. As language develops, new terms are coined, new brands emerge, so does the meaning of a search query and your ability to serve it with the most relevant content. You have to stay on top of these things. Um, sometimes competitors have updates. You might dominate the SERP for months, for years, uh, and Somebody else, especially if that starts growing in popularity, somebody else wants the top position for that keyword, especially if it's a competitive one with high volume. We worked with a client for a few years who was dominating the industry, uh, and then we stopped working together, and unfortunately, they completely stopped investing in SEO, and all of their competitors have made their way up replacing them on the CERT after, after a couple of years when they haven't been doing anything. So at any time, somebody can build a better, more updated piece of content. They can build more backlinks. Um, you have climbed to the top once, but you can get knocked off at any time, and especially if the keyword is more competitive. Uh, another reason that you might want to re-optimize content is new keyword opportunities. So well, it's not just older content that decays. New content has the potential to add hundreds of additional keywords and be far more successful than the first time you published it. So it's kind of like when you're running an ad, you want to test some things. So you publish something with your hypothesis and then you get this data back. So um, one of the best ways that I have grown content is to publish. I wait a few months, then I check Google Search Console for all the other queries people have found through the content. And then I add it back into the content through subheadings. Um, if they're very close to the primary keyword or throughout the body. It also can give you ideas for generating brand new content when you're looking at that. 
Um, and then I always resubmit it through Google Search Console. I know that Google says that that doesn't matter, but I've always seen that actually work for me. Um, and this helps me really see exponential growth in the content that I've recently published. Then there's outdated content. So in the last five years, the world has gone through so many versions of unprecedented times that content has become outdated so fast. We wrote a whole six to nine months worth of content for a client and it was all around COVID. Uh, and then we had to change basically all of it because the same service, which it was for a, um, a smart lock provider, it was like a SaaS smart lock provider connecting between a property management system and the smart lock. Uh, all of it was, we want the smart locks because guests, because it was for vacation rental hosts, guests don't want to have to interact with the host because of COVID, because they want to be safe. Um, whereas a couple of years after that, then it was the labor shortage. There was a hospitality labor shortage. They didn't have enough people to actually service the guests. So people didn't care about COVID anymore at all. They still wanted the smart lock, but it wasn't because of that. It was because we wanted to use fewer employees, right? So we had to completely change the language there for it to make any sense. And if I read anything now about the pandemic, it feels totally outdated to me. We've moved on to a completely new set of problems. So even maybe, I don't know what's going to come next, but there was, you know, the great, um, what was it, when all the employees left, I can't remember what the term was, <laughs> uh, but the employees didn't want to work anymore uh, for, they, they were leaving the great recession, recession, anyway. Uh, that was a problem last year. Now it's a new thing. Now it's all the layoffs. So all of these things, we have to stay up to date and make sure that our content is actually resonating with the problems of today. Uh, Google prioritizes fresh content and so do your users. Okay, so now we know reasons to update the content. We can talk about how to see what content needs to be updated. So these are the main metrics that indicate it's time for a re-optimization. Um, we have traffic. So these are all individual page metrics, because if you're looking at this on a holistic level, uh, it's kind of hard to identify what it is that you need to be re-optimizing. But these are the metrics that I would pay attention to at an individual page level. Has traffic gone down to the page? And a lot of these are going to happen at the same time. So has rankings gone down? Not only for uh, the one primary keyword, but all of the keywords it ranks for. Because as you start to build content, it adds and adds and adds keywords. So some of the best performing content is going to rank for hundreds or thousands of keywords, right? So if you gain keywords, traffic go up. If you lose keywords, traffic go down. And um, you want to keep track of all the primary keywords there and, and make sure that that number keeps growing. So if you are starting to lose rankings, content might be decaying. If CTR is going down, content maybe is decaying, maybe not. Maybe you need to make some changes though. Uh, if engagement goes down, maybe it means that your content is out of date and not that interesting. And conversions. And this is an interesting one. I wasn't sure if I was uh, going to include this because we're really talking about SEO optimizations here. Um, not conversion rate optimization, but I still think that optimizing for conversions can be a part of your SEO optimization plan because you still do want to do that. For example, if you had a whole set of articles that are performing really well in terms of traffic, but nothing is happening after that, maybe you want to explore how can I improve um, the actual next steps that are happening and the actual conversions that are happening for the user, the SEO user that has come to my page. So a drop in traffic. So this is the traffic of one page, for example. So if healthy SEO means the traffic needs to be going up month over month. So if it starts to plateau or if it starts to drop, you probably have to put it into the list of things that you need to fix. And again, this could be due to an algorithm update, all of those things that I talked about. So you want to investigate and see. A lot of people have been declining in traffic since July of last year, since the recent updates. And it probably means that they need to revamp a lot of that traffic. And I would recommend that they look on the individual page level um, in addition to creating new helpful content. Uh, in a similar vein, if you were in the top three for 10 keywords on a page and it suddenly drops, suddenly you lose keywords, there's an issue. So here we can see that uh, there was whatever 159 plus 131 was, they lost all of these keywords and it's changing in traffic. Uh, and they've lost $100 in value for this one page. So you it adds up, especially if you have a lot of pages, this starts to add up quite rapidly. Um, and again, 
conversion rates. So if content is performing well, but not converting enough, you may be able to improve it. So just because one page, um, you want to keep in mind all the different types of conversion with types of content and how they might convert differently. So just because one of your pages converts at 5%, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with another page that converts at 1%. They might be different types of content. Uh, and it might not make sense for a user to convert so highly on that page. But if it's dropping a lot or it's unusually low, it's something that you want to look into. What has changed? Why is this conversion rate changing so drastically? Um, another thing that I always try to do in my reoptimizations, if I'm seeing that it's not converting that well, is how can I make the conversion step easier for the search intent? So um, can I offer a conversion that is more aligned with the search intent? So if somebody is searching for how to create content marketing strategy, instead of giving them a generic invitation to sign up to my newsletter or to book a call or something, I could offer a comprehensive content marketing strategy template as a lead magnet. And so creating lead magnets that are super tied to the search intent can help increase conversion rate. So even creating these additional assets can be a part of the reoptimization strategy. Uh, and then again, a change in CTR, uh, most cases will mean that you, most cases, the reason a change in CTR happens is because you've dropped in rankings. Um, so if you can get those ranking back up, CTR will probably go up, but it might mean something else. You might have to just change the title tag or something simple like that, or it maybe means that there's a featured snippet or some other kind of um, feature that has appeared. Uh, and then again, if your content is outdated or it's no longer relevant to your users, you're going to see a drop in engagement rate. So um, you guys probably already know this, but engagement rate is the new bounce rate or it's the opposite of it. Uh, Google defines it as how many people on your page either stay for longer than 10 seconds or take an action when they're on your page. So if they immediately leave, it's a sign you probably want to re-optimize. Okay. So now that we know what to look for, we're going to talk about setting up your actual content re-optimization workflow. So they need to be in your calendar. It needs to be something that goes in there all the time. Um, because you have to be doing it regularly. It's not something that you just do at the beginning. It's not something that you just do once a year. I see way too many content calendars that are just full of new content. The reoptimizations need to be a part of your content calendar. You need to save space for them. So in order to kind of, because as you guys know, there's different levels of optimization. Uh, and since we run the agency, we had to try to build a tiered system to understand how we're charging the client, how we're explaining it to the client. So it might be helpful for you, even if you're in-house, I think, because it's can, it can help you plan out availability. So we have this uh, gold tiered, gold, silver, bronze system. So for gold, we consider it basically a whole new piece of content. The only thing that's staying is basically the URL. The old piece, we can use it as reference material, the same as we'd use another top 10 ranking. Um, but we're writing a whole new thing. So the reason you, excuse me, the reason we may want to do this is because the search intent may be changed. So maybe it's actually going to be a completely new piece, a new format, a new page type. The page types that you have, of course, are uh, articles, product pages, category page, home page. Uh, I think that's kind of it. I might be missing something, but it might change, for example, from a product page to a blog post. That has happened a lot. We've seen that where things used to be a product page and then it turned into a roundup page for the same keyword. So then you have to create a new piece of content. Um, you may want to do a gold reoptimization if it's totally outdated, as we mentioned before, or if the content is bad. Sometimes we inherit content and we see that the content's just badly written and it's going to get slaughtered by the oncoming algorithm updates if we don't update it, or maybe it already has. So this gold update in our content calendar takes the place of one full blog post. So if I have the capacity of 50 articles a month, um, I'm going to have 49 new ones and a gold one, and that takes up the whole slot. Silver updates, we have kind of calculated this to be half of a blog post although it's give and take. I mean, you don't always know for sure, but that's kind of how we calculate it. So silver content update is when the content that exists that is there is good. It's fine, but you want to add in more keywords or you're missing or your competitor answers this question and you don't answer that question and you want to add that in or you want to expand, you want to add an FAQ, but basically you have to add more content, but you keep what's there. Uh, or maybe you just add a few updates and then add a little bit of content. So 
this is what we call a silver update. And for us, this takes the place of half of a blog post. So if I have the capacity to do 50 blog posts, I can do one gold, two silver, and 48 new blog posts. Um, so the percentage of how much you're going to spread this out, these updates, it depends on you. I'm going to try to give you an example, but it's going to change for every every team because you are publishing at a different cadence and you have different resources than everybody. So you really have to think about this as you go. Um, if you are publishing very little content or if you've just started to publish content, it doesn't need to be as tight and organized because you have to build up your content library before you have enough uh, content to re-optimize. But if you're publishing high volumes, you really need to have a tight system around this. So managing your content re-optimization, other than just re-optimizing. So when I say re-optimizing, I mean like these things, rewriting, adding keywords, adding paragraphs, those kind of things. There's other things. So on page, there's other things that you might want to do as well. So you might want to prune content. You might find content that um, doesn't, brings zero traffic, or that's probably the main reason. If it's bringing zero traffic or it's totally irrelevant, it's not helping you build topical authority, you might want to get rid of that content. Or you might want to merge content. So um, for example, if you have these original keywords that you see could be performing a little bit better, you could identify how can I put these together because they're cannibalizing each other. So for example, what is CRM and benefits of CRM? Somehow these could probably be merged. Um, you could retarget the keyword to another keyword. If you find that, for example, you might publish a page and you had your hypothesis and you said, I'm optimizing this page for this keyword. And then suddenly you see it's ranking for another keyword completely, but that is relevant to you still. You might want to redo that page so that it's actually optimized for that one, hoping that it's not a huge change. So for example, if you had an original target keyword where you said remote work tools and you got your clear scope report and you optimize it all for remote work tools and it ends up ranking for work from home software, um, you have to actually re-optimize it. And, and probably the content won't be that different, but you're, if it's optimized for remote work tools, it's going to be hard to get it all the way up to number one. And so if you see it's in position eight or somewhere close to that, you can retarget the keyword. Um, and then you can also build links, for example. So if internal links, you can add more internal links. This is a super easy win. I see a lot of pages that they say we've done everything, but there's only a couple internal links pointing to it. This is one of the most high impact things that you could do is add more internal links from your pages. Um, I learned in another ClearScope webinar a while back that um, the, it cut off point or the point of diminishing return is about 20 internal links pointing to a page. But up to there, it has a huge impact. And then after that, it doesn't have such a huge impact. But if you could get 20 internal links pointing to a page, I haven't tested that. I, just, I remember learning it somewhere. Um, or external links. So if you're, yeah, if you're actually still on internal links, if your post has, if you have posts that you published two years ago and you've published a lot of new content in the meantime, you can go back to your old content and then see in your new content, where are there opportunities to link back to that old content? We actually have a process um, in the content creation process where we always link back to old content and uh, within the piece, we have an uh, anchor text and internal linking um, table where we have to add it into the new content. And then also we have to go back into old content and add links to that. So it's a two-way thing. Um, and you could conversion rate optimize. That might not be your forte. You might want to work with somebody who can do that. If you have enough traffic, you may be able to A-B test, or you can test a hypothesis and see, maybe even add CTAs. There's so many SEO websites that still don't, or SEO content that still doesn't have any CTAs, which is shocking. Um, so one just quick example. I spoke to Amelia from UserPilot. I hope she's okay with me <laughs> this year. She, uh, she's published a lot about this very openly. But her SEO workflow is um, they do 60 pages per month of net new content, 40 pages a month of programmatic SEO, and updating existing content, 28 pieces per month. So if we take out the programmatic SEO, then we have 100 pages a month in the content calendar. Because programmatic, I guess, is probably in a different system. It's not exactly going to be in a calendar. Maybe, maybe not. But let's just say it's 100. You want to keep track of this system, right? So 
it's good for you to create a type of workflow. So here's an example of workflow. I, it looks pretty tiny. Hold on, let me see if I can zoom in. Zoom in. Okay, I can't seem to zoom into this. Oops. Um, but I'll send this to you. And in any case, this isn't set in stone. What I want to invite you to do is actually create your own prioritization workflow, but make a decision about how you're going to make these decisions. Because otherwise, every single month, every quarter, whenever you're doing this, you're going to be like, ah, oh, how do I choose? How do I choose? So here, what I have, and I can read it for you, is evaluate traffic engagement metrics. Or so I use performance data. So I'm looking, is the content experiencing a significant performance drop? No, don't reoptimize now. If you only have a limited number of pieces and you have a ton of stuff to reoptimize, uh, if it is, does the content drive significant traffic and engagement now? Normally, or did it normally do it? Yes, prioritize. No, does the content contribute to conversion goals? Is it a high converting piece, but it's just not performing that well in traffic? Yes, prioritize. No, uh, are there quick wins? Can you quickly reoptimize uh, re it without too much effort? Um, if it's yes, maybe you can throw it in there. If it's like a bronze, I didn't even go through the bronze reops actually. Uh, so the bronze is just, can I update meta titles, title tags, like just add a couple subheadings, those kind of things. If it's a bronze, just throw it in there. If you have the time, give yourself the time every month to do a couple of bronzes here and there. Um, consider seasonal relevance. So is it seasonally relevant? Best SEO conferences of 2025. Right now, maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe at the end of the year, we need to do that. Or in November, it's going to be a pri uh, priority, right? So those kind of pieces you do want to prioritize. Um, does the content have strong backlinks or high domain authority? Does it help you drive page equity, uh, link equity to the other pages that you publish? Yes, maybe you want to allocate. Uh, if it, yes, prior, put it into your workflow. No, focus on the new content creation or choose a different piece. So it doesn't have to be this, and this is not perfect, but it's just the fact that you have designed your workflow. This is how I'm going to make decisions. This is my framework. It really helps reduce the load, the strategic load that it's going to take you every month or every period, whatever period you choose to do this in. Um, so this is just an example of how it looks in a content calendar. So we have new, 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 silver, silver, gold, silver. So we kind of know the amount of work that it's going to take us and we can plan ahead. Uh, because again, you don't need to do a full rewrite for all of the content that you're doing. So here's an example. So I'm about to go through a cadence of content reoptimization, and it might be way too much for the amount of content that you publish. You might be publishing way less. Uh, it might not work for you. It really depends on your resources. I'm giving you an example to be able to inspire you to set up this workflow so that, and then you can use this if you want, um, or you can design your own. I would recommend also using chat GPT to ask, how can I best divide this cadence? Because that's that's actually really helpful. But so here's an example if you're publishing 100 pieces a month. So a monthly review process, for example. So if I'm publishing 100 pages a month and I want to maybe match what user pilot is doing and do 30 pages a month are going to be re-optimized, you still have to choose which 30 pages and why. OK, so if I'm looking at so every month, I would look at the top 10 performing articles in the absolute highest traffic or highest converting. And I track keywords in the key metrics. So if I see some changes here, these are signs to me because here I've seen I've lost 22 keywords. Uh, I've lost hundreds in traffic already just with these. So I would probably want to reoptimize these. Um, user pilot is not my client, by the way. I've just selected them <laughs> randomly because I recently had this conversation with Amelia. Um, so. Focus on the best performing articles and you want to just make sure at this point, you're not yet looking at new articles that you've published. We're getting, I've put that into another one of the um, reviews, but I just want to see, am I staying in the positions one to three for these top pages uh, or the top keywords that I want to be ranking for? So these should be just bronze or silver and internal links, those kind of things. And this is every month, except the months you are doing other reviews. So that would be eight times a year. Then you have a quarterly review process. So in my quarterly review process, which I would have twice a year, because then I also have biannual and annual, um, I conduct a mini audit of my top 50 articles. Again, this is if you have a ton of articles, because if you've only published 50 total, this would be a full content audit, right? So in this scenario, I say, okay, every quarter, I'm going to audit my top 50 articles. Again, here, I'm prioritizing by losses, traffic losses. 
Um, and then I'm aiming to add about 50 to 60 pages to re-optimize. So if you can see here, I've only added, oh, it here, I, sorry, I didn't add it here, but I would say maybe two for the monthly one, because I'm actually going to spread out the pieces that I find in my quarterly, biannual, and annual. So it actually evens out, and I'll show you a table breakdown where it actually spreads out to where I am doing about 30 per month. Um, so in the quarterly review process, I can add about 50 to 60. There's no monthly review this month. And again, I'm, I'm prioritizing losses. Um, I always recommend that you have a handful of silver size, whatever you want to call them, silver tier reoptimizations in your calendar um, for the content that you've published a couple of months before, but I'll go into that in a second. So in the biannual review process, this is a comprehensive audit of all of your audit in the last six months. And especially... I would want to look here at the content that I've published with the published date that is between the last biannual or annual review and the one before it. So this means it's been at least six months that I've published it. And this is where I'm going to find new keyword opportunities. So this is a part of the process as well as how can I make sure that I'm not forgetting about recent content, because if you're only looking at losses, you're not going to be you're not going to see the opportunities for more growth you're only trying to save decaying content so if we really want exponential content we want to make sure that we're always saving a place to say okay content that is actually growing not decaying but how can i make it grow more and how can i add more of these opportunities so in this case i said i'm going to put it in the biannual again you design this how you want but as long as you have a defined process for it so i put it in the biannual every six months i look at content that's been published at least six months before and within that time period so not super old content uh, and i see what kind of keywords i can add to that uh, and then i can prioritize here based on opportunity signals so high impressions low clicks ranking between positions four to twenty uh, highly converting those kind of things because then you're going to add opportunity. And again, in this biannual review process, you're looking for about 100 pages, a higher proportion of content for new keyword opportunity. Uh, sorry, you aim for 100 pages of reoptimization. A higher proportion of those 100 pages go to new keyword opportunity pages, so growth pages. Um, and then you have your annual review process, where here you review your whole review process, your optimization strategy this year. So how did that go? Did that work for me? Did it did it work for me tactically, as in practically? Was I able to get it into the calendar? Was I able to optimize all of the pages that I wanted to optimize every month? One good rule of thumb that you can give yourself is uh, you want to optimize all of your content twice a year. So if you want to optimize all of your content twice a year, or revisit it, at least review it and add new things to it, how much do you need to be doing this? So did that work for you? Were you able to optimize everything? Um, and this annual review process, you also want to put it in your checklist to check all the foundation and cornerstone content. So stuff that has a lot of screenshots, screenshots are probably out to date, especially out of date, especially if it's product content. Um, are there competitor mentions? If you're writing these roundup pages, top 10 uh, best competitors in this, Depending on your market, so if you're in like financial loans or something, those businesses go out of business so fast in one year, your competitors might not even exist anymore, or there might be a new set of competitors. And so you want to make sure that you're doing that. Or in a space like SaaS, where the product features are growing so fast, honestly, I think a year might be too slow to be updating those kind of pieces because your competitors are launching new features all the time and you want to make sure that you're the most up to date there so these are the kind of things you want to put in there of course you change all of the years in your content that has a year please never put the year in your url but everything that's in the title go through all of them replace it with the next year uh and focus here on new keyword opportunities and content decay so you kind of mix and match them because this, if it's your annual, it's going to be the next one after next six months after the biannual. And then you revisit and adjust the optimization strategy based on what are your new resources next year? What's your budget? What's your goals? Those kind of things are going to help you rebuild this framework and set it in a way that you can follow it and stick to it. So here's kind of just an example of what it might look like if we followed that. So you can see if we wanted 30 pages a month, I've allocated about 360 here. So annual, it wouldn't go to 132 because you actually pass it on. Here, it wouldn't really be, uh, oh yeah, so you allocate 30 and then it gets passed on to the next month. So it gets distributed. So you can see that even if I found this many pages to re-optimize, 
I publish them all throughout the year or I keep I put them in the content calendar and then I've uh, updated my 360 pages. So again, you want to, when you're revisiting your content, you want to see next year, am I planning to publish more content? Because if you're publishing more content, then you need to, you're going to have to optimize more content, right? So you need to bake that into your capacity and say, do I have actually the resources to do this? Are you trying to incorporate more EEAT this year? Maybe you need even more space in your content reoptimization strategy, even if you aren't increasing the amount of content that you publish, but you realized a lot of the content from back then didn't have EEAT. So actually this is going to have to be half and half this year. Um, have the audience changed or your value prop changed? So you probably want to start going through more content uh, to update and align with your new vision. So you just have to try to understand what is coming next year and then rebuild your workflow around that. Um, so that is actually everything for me today. I hope it hasn't been too overwhelming. If you have way less content than 100 pieces a month, which probably a lot of people do, then you kind of work out the workflow on your own, right? So if you want to have everything, if you want to have, um, if you publish six articles a month and you want to update everything twice a year, you have a couple hundred uh, pieces after two years. So you actually would do half and half. So you have to try to decide based on how often do I want to update content and then do the math to try to figure out the percentage also based on your own resources and growth goals. So I'll wrap that up here. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to answer some questions. Wow, that was so actionable, so fantastic. I love the the gold, silver, bronze analogies. You know, it resonates with like Paris Olympics 2024. <laughs> you know, <I> <laughs> um, and you know, I'll I'll lead us off to say that uh, it looks like a ton of work, a ton of management, a ton of stuff going on. So, Maeva, how would it look if somebody wanted to engage with you on a content reoptimization project for flying cat how would it look um like an engagement rare, with you it, yeah it's rare that a that a client would come just for a content reoptimization project because we'd mm -hmm. say what is the whole goal and do we have other things that we need to do but let's say that we find that we only need the content reoptimization right um so in that case initially and as you would have seen here, as anybody starting a, an SEO project would do, you start with a full content audit. That's the first thing that you need to do. Start with the full, full content audit, and then uh, you prioritize based on that. I think it would really depend on how long they have been publishing for, what the issue is. Is it because they have, you want to identify the reasons that we found, do they have decay? That's probably the reason that they would want to re-optimize. So nobody's like growing, growing, growing. Well, I guess some people are growing, growing, growing and saying, we need to re-optimize the old content, but generally it's because they're decaying, right? So they need something to save. Um, so we'd have to identify all of those things. And then we put it in the calendar and start doing it. And a lot of the times bronze, we just kind of throw in there because some of them are super easy and super fast to do. Mm -hmm. uh, always allocate like a little bit of time to that. And then we put the silvers and golds in the calendar and then report on the reoptimizations that we do. Generally, we always do a mix though of new content and reoptimizations. I, I would recommend not ignoring new content because um, then you're not growing that forest bigger, right? You're just making the trees taller. So it would be a mix. It and then I would, mix. A, I, would, I would follow a process close to this or simpler uh, every month I have to do reporting anyway, right? So mm -hmm. in my reporting, I'm looking at this stuff anyway. Yeah. And my reporting, my reporting always drives what I'm going to be creating next. Absolutely. So it, it's, <laughs> kind of bunched, it's kind of bunched together. It's yeah. Just pay attention to. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, we're getting a nonstop flood of questions from the audience. And I know you got a hard stop on the hour. So I'm just going to jump into it. Some of these questions, uh, we we had one surface before the webinar, and I feel like it was addressed throughout your entire presentation. But I do want to just call it out that, you know, Jay, Jay Lynn Cameron asks, how would you structure a content calendar for a content marketing agency, blog and socials? That's one, doubling down on 100% human content assets. And two, hasn't experienced any lost SERP rank and otherwise hasn't been penalized by recent algorithm updates. 
for example, what historic topics would be the best targets for optimized refreshes? Okay, so if I understand the the website has been growing, it hasn't been traffic has not been declining, it has been growing, right? So right. I I think in any case, you're never gonna find a website where there's not some pages that are decaying. So there's for and I think I have addressed a lot of this, but some of the so even if you're growing, growing, growing with new content, it's gonna be more linear because some of your other content's going like this while it's going like this, right? So if you mm -hmm. were to just you're not going to get it all to go like that. So I would build out the workflow where everyone, most of the time I'm trying to identify the pages that are decaying um, and they're always going to be there. And then identify the new pages that I've published about six months ago and then tr add new keywords. So that those grow more like this than linearly. Yeah. Great. I think you touched a bit upon content pruning, but this question from Robert is, our website has a lot of old content. Should we put these old posts in private mode, not trash it? Like, is there ever a reason to not, yeah, like not prune content? And what are what are your, your best practices? Should somebody just want to slice off a bunch of underperforming <laughs> old content and not try to re-optimize it. I guess it's hard. Like if you have a lot of zero traffic content, I would prune zero. I, I mean, not if it's new content, if it's been there for a year and it's still zero con zero traffic, zero links, prune it. I think that's a pretty easy. Yes. That's going to help you. If it has some old links or it used to perform well, and then it's gone back down, I would try to check if it's a candidate for merging or re-optimizing before pruning it because, well, merging is, merging is in a way pruning it because you're getting rid of one and putting it into another one. So you're kind of choosing one of them is going to get pruned. Um, I would always rather do that first rather than get rid of a piece of content unless it is, unless you're trying to build a topical authority on a new topic or a different one and you have nothing to do with that other topic anymore and you want to get rid of the topical authority on that, then that's a good reason to also get rid of it. Uh, if it's just super outdated, you could update it. If it's still relevant, you could just get that key. You probably would be easier to get that keyword back up. I've done that before. I was like, this piece is so old. And I was like, well, I could actually just completely update it, target, retarget the keyword, and then it ranked really well. So you could, I would rather do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little, little bit of like this flow chart thing, depending on like links, traffic, you know, yeah. just different, there different is, things. Right. I would say there's no scientific prioritization model, but I, <laughs> it saves a lot of time to ha create your own and say, this is how I'm going to make decisions. This is the data I'm going to look like it look at, I guess it's, you know, the magic of a, of an SOP. It, it saves you time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Makes sense. I'm going to hit a bunch of, I think, the thematically, a bunch of the questions at once, or at least try to. And the the idea is around the publishing date and when certain pieces of content are also like date centric. So yeah. the question then is, you know, when would you optimize and advise to update content that has like years in it? You know, for example, when it comes to delivery times in the automotive industry or best lists, you know, like 2024 AI trends or something like that, you know, is, is this just something at the end of, of, you know, calendar year or beginning of the following calendar year, you just go and update it. And when you do update it, you know, should you stay with this whole 2024 and, you know, change the published date or have a last modified yeah. date? What do you think about all of that? So there's a lot of different things to consider in here. And one of them is what's the actual topic. So if you tell me best AI trends in 2024, no way I can just update that once a year. <laughs> I have to update that once a month, probably, <laughs> because that's just so volatile, right? Um, <clears throat> I actually remember when I first used ClearScope and you, Bernard, gave me a run, run through of how to use it. And you showed me how certain keywords have 
super high volatility and certain keywords don't, right? Like sometimes when you like the volatility is really low and it's usually because of the topic. So it, when you're doing your keyword research, you could also make a note, depending on the industry that you're in, sometimes the industries aren't going to be that volatile. Some like finance, stocks, you know, those kind of things. Some of them are changing daily. If it's changing daily, you probably want to do something programmatic rather than having to update that content every day. But it really depends on the topic. So yeah, AI trends, I would probably, if I really want to rank for that, I would most likely have to update it every month or every quarter, um, even if the it says 2024. Uh, if it's like events for that year, once a year is fine. If it's kind of evergreen content, but it has 2024 in the title, you just change the year once a year, uh, as long as the actual things haven't really changed too much. And if you're not, if you're decaying, you will probably want to update it and add more things. In terms of the publishing date, um, I usually always add the publishing date, or I, I will actually change change the date unless you have sometimes it's like date it just says date and then I would change the date to the new one or sometimes it says published and then updated depending on the website all of our clients have a different situation I think it's nice to have the published and then updated because it shows that it's keep staying up to date um so there's a lot of different ways you can do that and unfortunately I had to do have to say it depends <laughs> it depends on the topic and how volatile it is I think yeah. I answered that. There was like a lot of questions in one. Uh, yeah, I tried to, I tried to con consolidate it and I apologize if that was a little bit confusing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and then, you know, I, I feel like there's been like further findings from like Lily and Cyrus, how, you know, actually putting last updated in your title 2024 is like now like an anti-pattern in SEO or something like that. So it's just like, uh yeah it's a it's a tough it's a tough it's a tough environment out well, there. I don't know sometimes I think that that kind of things is is minutia like whether to put the date or not if you keep it up or last updated or what I don't know if that's a detail that's the most important one to think about versus is my content actually super up to date and yeah. useful yeah I, I, that's that's the guiding light right is it useful yeah. and you know that's that's where it should go all right so shannon asks do you check every blog individually or do you check for a drop in rankings first i do the latter we have over 200 articles and just me trying to optimize them all while editing other people's contributions creating new articles i optimize but not with much strategy so yes it's i i suppose it's more around the you know, what, what are the leading indicators of what deserves a refresh? Is it purely drop in rankings or, you know, other things? Um, so I, I was actually wanted to kind of demonstrate it to you guys, but then I realized I'm on NDA and I couldn't show you any of my clients <laughs> data. So I wanted to show how I was going to do it. Um, so I would export from Google search console first, cause first I'm looking at clicks and rankings, right. And then you can kind of filter by order. So you can see, uh, greatest losses there, um, difference in clicks from the month before or from the quarter before, and you can organize it that way. You can also see it on Ahrefs. So first I would look at, at the holistic level, um, like this person said. And then you want to look at it on an individual level because you can't just plop them all on there. And that's where I use that kind of workflow. So like, do I actually care about this page? Was it bringing me a lot of traffic before? Um, is this a highly converting page? Does it contribute to the other topic clusters that I'm building? So you need to have your own kind of prioritization framework. And again, I'll share this with you. You can use mine if you want, or you can design your own. It depends on your business and your KPIs as well. Because um, a lot of SEOs now are responsible for pipeline and some of them aren't responsible at all for that. They're going to be measured on a completely different metric. So you want your, your framework to be aligned with what you are being held responsible for. If you're by yourself, you're going to be re-optimizing all of them. That's why I say you have to put it in your content workflow because you shouldn't count it as an extra thing. It goes into your content pipeline. So if you say, I have the, I have the capacity to create 10 pages a month and I need to re-optimize all these pages, then I actually have the capacity to create five new pages a month and five gold pages or 10 silver optimizations a month. That is my capacity. I'm not doing it on the side. 
Um, so you need to be able to fit it into that. Absolutely. So that, that kind of brings us to this other interesting question that Aaron asks. Do you have recommendations for choosing key search terms? How can you identify what terms are too high? We'll say, you know, in difficulty. And, you know, how do you how do you think about the the idea of like building either domain or topical authority up to a certain point to then qualify to rank for, you know, more difficult keywords? This is it's not actually about optimization. It's about keyword strategy, right? Or is it related? Is it? I, I suppose it doesn't specifically call out optimize like content optimization, but I could see how, you know, it, it could fit the bill in that, you know, like, let's say you're looking at an existing piece of content that you've published that is, you know, around a very high difficulty, you know, keyword and it's yes. not performing well. So I, you know, putting that lens on, right? Like at what point do you then say, okay, you know, this is too difficult, you know, we need to, uh, yeah, we need supporting content or we yeah. just need to prune this or re retune it to make it, you know, target a less difficult thing. That's, that's a good, good question. Um, so there's a few, so I generally would always try to build more topical, like build more content around it rather than, especially if it's a, if it's a keyword that's super important to my business and then I'm not ever going to be like, oh, I'll just give up on that. Um, you know, we're going to build around it, especially if I'm choosing SEO, I'm choosing SEO as my business channel, that keyword is super important to me. We're not going to give up on it. We're going to try. Um, but I would also want to build a strategy to where I'm not only reliant on that keyword to drive business, but I'm reliant on everything that's around it. So one of the ways that I start to choose keywords for clients, and I know that keyword difficulty as a metric um, is controversial and not always useful, but I do find it to be useful actually. Um, so I'd like to get a keyword baseline. So I look at the clients, um, what they do have ranking in the top five positions and what the average. So I tally how many of those pieces, what their keyword difficulty is. And then I get a bit of a range and the ranges do change depending on how much content they have. And there, to me, I've seen a clear correlation between the range, like how far in difficulty they can go with the amount of content that they have published. So I see that correlation. So I get that kind of keyword difficulty range. And then I start to build a topical authority within that range, maybe a little bit on the edge of it. I probably, if the range is up to 25 and then the keyword I want to go for is 60, um, I probably don't go after it immediately. I start to build around that until my range starts to go up and up. And it might be a super long-term thing, actually. Uh, if the keyword I want to go after is slightly over it, then it's just a stretch. Then I think that I can do it and I'll do extra for it. Um, if it's, you know, sometimes people get really obsessed with a keyword if they work in a CRM, they work in a CRM SaaS and then they want to rank for CRM. Like you don't need to rank for CRM to hit your goals. Your goal is never going to be just to rank for that keyword. So think about your goals and then <laughs> build what's you, you can build your way up to that, but I don't know if it's going to be necessary and it's going to be so much effort to try to rank for some of those keywords. And you could have put that effort elsewhere. I kind of went on a tangent <laughs> no 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 I, I think it, it's not it's not so straightforward and I oh. totally make sense we only have a couple minutes so I'm gonna turn this more into rapid fire so if you just have you know one two sentences to go then okay. I think we can knock out the majority of the rest of the open questions so Melissa asks are there any other engagement metrics to consider besides time spent on page and bounce rate I think you can see scroll depth. If you look at hot jar, you can also see like rage clicks. Um, that's a little bit, not so much SEO, but it actually has helped me get a lot of good SEO ideas. Um, looking at hot jar, what else? Um, time spent on page. That's cool. 
Yeah. All right. Kelly asks, I think this is in reference to user pilot and Emilia. What size team is she running to publish a hundred pages a month? I seriously oh, want to yeah. know. I'm being asked to do that with two people. It's definitely not two people. She told me, oh, what was it? I can't remember exactly. I'm, I'm, I, the reason I knew all this is because I interviewed her because I'm doing a case study on user pilot, but I uh -huh. haven't written it yet. And she told me the team size. I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I can't answer you, but I will come, or you can ask her, I'm sure she'll tell you as well. <laughs> uh, how about this? So, you know, if you were tasked with publishing 100 pieces of content, how big of a team would you need? How big of a team would I need? Yeah. Uh, I have published hundreds of pieces of content a month, and I had a team of about uh, like 10, 15. Okay. All right. But that, uh, that includes SEOs, project managers, all that. I think you could do it with less. Right. Right. All right. Last question. Parole asks, what would be the best way to look at product description pages? Do we need to change the language, the format? He or she particularly deals with party supplies. Product descriptions. Product descriptions. I think it depends on what's happening on the page, what you're trying to improve. So if you're, tr yeah, it depends on if you're trying to improve rankings and sometimes uh, it's just about adding more, a little bit more information, improving some metadata, adding internal links, more internal links. That is a huge one. Don't forget it. Uh, or sometimes product pages actually need to be blog posts, unfortunately, but I don't know if that's the case for party supplies. Cool. Well, I think that that's a wrap and I learned a ton. Thank you so much for coming, sharing all of your wisdom around content optimization. I think this is one of the most misunderstood and you know misguided part of SEO content workflows, right? I think people love creating new content, auditing for technical stuff, but there's just this missing link in you know making sure that you know your trees are are healthy and doing well. And I'm glad that you know we had you come in and, and give us some great talk about it, Maeva. Thank Any you. Any last Thank words? You for me. Um, no, I just really appreciate everybody being here and. Um, the attention for the last hour and thank you so much bernard and amanda for having me yeah it's the pleasure is all ours well thank you so much and catch all around in a future webinar